looking at article number eight on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. But before we dive into this particular article, let's make sure that we don't miss the forest for the trees. So remember that the way this confession of faith is written is to begin with the scriptures. To begin with the scriptures and the authority of the scriptures and the trustworthiness of the scriptures because it's only through the scriptures that we know anything about anything authoritatively, authoritatively from God. So we need the revelation that God gives us through the scriptures. And then the scriptures show us who God is truly. And we come to know God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then that brings us to who we are, man, mankind, human beings, and how we were created in the image of God, but what's wrong with us and our fallenness and sinfulness, and how we need to be saved, but we can't save ourselves. And so this brings us to the doctrine of salvation, what God has done through Christ to save sinners. And then we have the article on God's purpose of grace because salvation is by grace through faith. It's only the work of God's sovereign grace that any sinner can be saved. And then we've moved to the article on the church that by God's grace, we've been joined together with the body of Christ uh, universal. And the way the body of Christ shows up is in local bodies of believers who are worshiping and bearing witness to Christ. And we talked about what the church is and what the Lord expects the church to be doing. Then that brings us to baptism and the Lord's Supper, these two specific ordinances or commandments that Jesus has given to his church that he wants us to obey until he returns. Then the next question is, has the Lord given us any guidance on when he wants his church to gather, to assemble? And the answer is yes, he has. And it's what the New Testament calls the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day. So let's read the article together here, uh, number eight, the Lord's Day. The first day of the week is the Lord's Day. It is a Christian institution for regular observance. It commemorates the resurrection of Christ from the dead and should include exercises of worship and spiritual devotion, both public and private. Activities on the Lord's Day should be commensurate with the Christian's conscience under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So the Lord wants his people to worship on his day, which is the first day of the week, the day we call Sunday, Sunday. Why does he want us to worship on the first day of the week? And this this raises a a whole other question of the relationship between the Old Testament Sabbath, that is to be kept on the seventh day of the week, and the New Testament commandment to worship on the Lord's Day. What is the relationship here? So why the first day of the week? Well, for that, we turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 and the giving of the Ten Commandments here. And the way these commandments are traditionally numbered, uh, the fourth commandment says this in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. The Lord says through Moses, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, You shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. 
For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the Lord gave his people Israel this command to work for six days and to rest, to stop on the seventh day. And we're told in Exodus that the basis for this is in the pattern of creation, that the seven-day work week is an analogy based on the pattern of creation. And what we're told in Genesis chapter 2 is that on the seventh day, the Lord Sabbathed or ceased or stopped his work of creation. And so the Sabbath day is called Shabbat, to stop, to cease, to rest. And he instituted this for his people Israel here. And it's grounded in this pattern of creation. And so they're to keep it holy. It's to be set apart. It's to be distinct. It's not like any other day of the week. And then if you read the listing of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the same commandment is given to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, but the reason is different. It's not based on creation, it's based on God's redemption of his people out of slavery in Egypt. So this is a command that's grounded in the pattern of creation and grounded in the pattern of redemption when God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. That much is clear, that God gave the Sabbath to his people as a mark of the covenant, as a sign to show that they're different, that their work week is different, that the rhythm of their work and their rest is different, it's holy, it's distinct. Everyone agrees on that. After that, there are at least four different views on the relationship between the Old Testament Sabbath and the Lord's Day. Four different views among Christians. The first view I'm going to call the view that Sabbath is still Saturday. That Sabbath is still Saturday. And groups that hold to this view would include Seventh-day Adventists, where the name comes from, Seventh Day. Um, they're actually Seventh Day Baptists. It's a fairly small group, but there are Seventh Day Baptists who worship together on Saturday. And the argument that they would make is that this is one of the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments. And this should not be changed. And they would point to the fact that this is patterned after creation, that this is patterned after redemption, and that God hasn't authorized us to change this, and so the Sabbath day should still be Saturday. We shouldn't be gathering on Sunday. We should be gathering on Saturday. <clears throat> well, here's some objections to that. That's not the view reflected in the Baptist faith and message. One thing to note about Sabbath keeping is that God never rebukes any other nations for not keeping the Sabbath. They're rebuked for violence and murder. They're rebuked for idolatry, for greed, for coveting. They're rebuked for adultery, all, for robbery, all kinds of, of sinfulness. But God never holds the nations accountable for not keeping the Sabbath. And that seems to show something special about his people Israel. This is a command for his people Israel to keep, to show that they're distinct, they're different among the nations. And that points to the fact that this is limited in some way to Israel to Israel. Another objection is that in the New Testament, you can find explicit instruction to keep the other nine commandments, 
but we are never explicitly told to keep the Sabbath in this form in the New Testament. And so if it's the case that we should be worshiping on Saturday at the, after the pattern of Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, that we work for six days, we cease, we take a break, we rest on the seventh day, or what we call Saturday, then we're not giving any, any explicit command about that. And we're not giving any example in the New Testament that that's what the first Christians did. On the contrary, we're told that they assembled on the first day of the week, the day we call Sunday. And there are some specific examples of that. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we're told about when the Apostle Paul visited, vis visits this place named Troas. Acts 20, verse 7, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next, no next day, kept on talking until midnight. It's an interesting story there in Acts 20, but just notice here that they gather on the first day of the week to do what? To break bread, to enjoy fellowship together. It's possibly an allusion to the Lord's Supper. But what we're sure about is that preaching is happening. They gather to, to have fellowship and to hear preaching on the first day of the week, what we would call Sunday. You have something similar going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 2. Paul writing to the Corinthian Christians, Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So what he's telling them is something that he tells multiple churches, maybe all the churches. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. And his purpose is that he's collecting money to take to the church in Jerusalem, which is an impoverished church, a church in great need. So he's collecting, in effect, a love offering for showing mercy to the Christians in Jerusalem. And this offering is to be collected on the first day of the week when you come together. This is a pattern. And he says, this is the same thing I told the Galatian churches to. The phraseology of the Lord's Day, though, comes from Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I'll begin reading at verse 9. The Apostle John says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. On the Lord's day, on the Lord's day, he's in the Spirit, and he encounters the Lord Jesus. So that's where this language of Lord's Day comes from. And we know that as early as the second century, right after the end of the New Testament, early Christians are gathering and calling their gatherings Lord's Day gatherings. And they don't mean Saturday gatherings. They mean first day of the week, what we call Sunday gatherings. They're calling it the Lord's Day. So that's probably what the Apostle John is referring to in Revelation 1 verse 10. All right, so the first view I've described is Sabbath is still Saturday, but the objections are other nations are never held accountable for this. If this is something that's of abiding significance for all people at all times, why does God not give that commandment to other nations? We're never told to keep the Sabbath in this sense in the New Testament. We have no record of early Christians keeping the, the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week in the New Testament. On the contrary, what we find is they're gathering on the first day of the week that we call Sunday. Well, that's one view. Here's a second view, and this is probably the dominant view for most of church history, and that is that Sabbath is 
Sunday, that the Sabbath is Sunday. And sometimes in some confessions of faith, such as the Westminster Confession of Faith, the, the, the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689 that's based on the Westminster Confession refers to the Christian Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath. And the view here is that because the resurrection of Jesus happened on the first day of the week, that has now become the day on which Christians are to remember and keep holy a day of of worship. And that means for them that all the instruction regarding the seventh day Sabbath now applies to Sunday. And this goes way back. So the Emperor Constantine in the year 321, when you're starting to see this alliance between churches and and the state, he decreed that the first day of the week is a day of rest and worship throughout the empire. Everyone has to shut down. And all Sabbath laws that we find in the Old Testament are applied to Sunday. No working whatsoever. No working whatsoever. The day is to be entirely devoted to worship, worship and, and spiritual devotion. And this carries forward uh, to uh, the early days of this country in Puritan New England. Um, laws were developed called blue laws. Are you familiar with blue laws? I haven't found a good explanation as to why they're called blue laws. Some people say it's because they're, they were printed on blue paper. Some people say it's because they were blue-nosed, as in uh, puritanical or pr- priggish. Uh, no one seems to know for sure, but the point was everybody had to close. All businesses had to close on Sundays, and there could be no worldly amusement, no worldly entertainment whatsoever on Sundays. Strictly forbidden. And Actually, in an earlier version of the Baptist faith and message, and the, the one dated in 1925, and it continued in uh, an update in 1963, after this line about um, how it should include exercises of, of worship and spiritual devotion, both public and private, this is what it said. And by refraining from worldly amusements and resting from secular employments, works of necessity and mercy only accepted. So that means you shouldn't be working on Sunday, if you can help it, if you can help it. Uh, of course, we need people in hospital rooms, we need people in police cars, etc., so th- those are uh, necessities. But if you can help it, this view would say you should not be working on Sunday. You should not be cutting your grass on Sunday. You should not be going to a movie theater on Sunday. You should not be going to a restaurant on Sunday. And some of these blue laws still show up. In the state of North Carolina, I believe, you still can't hunt on a Sunday. And I don't know exactly what the history of that law is, but that's still in the books. Blue laws are very much embedded in some of our legal structure. They're, they're going away quickly, uh, but the remnants are there. What's the problem with this? Well, it's not because it's too stringent. Uh, we should never object to God's word because it just seems too hard or unreasonable to us. But it's hard to reconcile the Sabbath as Sunday view with what we read in a passage like Colossians 2, verses 16 to 17. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So here in Colossians 2, Paul seems to be saying that no one should be watching to see whether or not you're cutting your grass on a Sunday. 
that no one should be using this as a legalistic test of your obedience. That somehow th this is not something that applies now in the way that it did then. So there are problems with seeing the Sabbath as Sunday. That's the second view. A third view is that the Sabbath teaching in the Old Testament is purely ceremonial. It is purely ceremonial. And it only applied to Israel. It doesn't apply to the church. And therefore, it doesn't apply to us. And proponents of this view would say that the other nine commandments are moral. The Sabbath commandment is ceremonial. An objection to this would be that often it's very difficult to tease out the difference between a moral command and a ceremonial command in the Old Testament. They're bound together often. So that's one problem. The other problem is that as the Seventh-day Adventists would argue, this is grounded in creation. It's based on the pattern of creation. Sabbath teaching that, that you work for six days, you rest on the seventh, is, is based on the pattern we see in Genesis chapter 2, the pattern that God himself established. And as we, we saw in Deuteronomy 5, it's grounded in redemption. It's patterned on when God redeemed his people out of slavery in Egypt. So how can this only be ceremonial if that's the reason for keeping it? All right, so third view is Sabbath is ceremonial, only ceremonial, has no ongoing applicability to us. The fourth view, and the view that I'm going to defend, and I believe it's the view um, most consistent with what we read here in the Baptist Faith and Message, and that is that the Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ. The Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ, in his person and in his work. So the Sabbath teaching that we read in Exodus 20 is given inside the framework of the Mosaic covenant. Moses is the mediator, was the mediator of that covenant. But as the book of Hebrews tells us over and over again, in Christ we have a better mediator of a better covenant, of a better covenant. And so we receive the Ten Commandments not through Moses, but through Christ. And Christ, as the mediator, shows us how they're to be interpreted and how they're to be applied. And in Matthew 5, verse 17, recall that Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven." Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. So we can't just cut that part of the Bible out. He did come to fulfill it, as in to perfectly obey what God intended when he gave the Sabbath commandment to his people. Uh, in Romans 10, we read that Christ is the culmination of the law, the end of the law, the goal of the law. Romans 10, 4, Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. We receive the righteousness of Christ, his fulfillment of every commandment by believing, by trusting in him, by faith. Let's also see what Jesus does with the Sabbath in his earthly ministry. So for that, let's turn to, math, to Mark, Mark chapter 2, and look at verses 23 to 27. The gospel of Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 27. 
One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Okay, so Jesus and his disciples are are walking along in the grain fields, picking some to eat. They're hungry. And the Pharisees come along and say, "Uh uh-uh, don't you know what day it is? This is the seventh day, what we would call Saturday. You're not allowed to work on the seventh day. You're breaking the law. And Jesus' response says, well, haven't you ever heard what David did? when he and his companions were hungry. And he didn't just pluck some wheat out of a wheat field. He ate the consecrated bread, the consecrated bread on the Sabbath, and then he gave some to his companions. And the point that Jesus is making is that they have turned Sabbath keeping into something God never intended it to be. He's showing that the Sabbath is a gift from God to his people a gift to structure and and provide rhythm for their work and their rest. It's not supposed to be a legalistic test of obedience and and fellowship. They've twisted it. They've turned it into something burdensome. When a hungry person can't get something to eat, something is terribly wrong. We're using this precious gift that God has given his people and then turning it into something to hit people with. Get your hands away from that food. He's like, you've turned it upside down. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And he claims that he, as the Son of Man, is Lord even of the Sabbath. He's in charge. He determines what Sabbath keeping should look like. And he fulfills the law in its entirety, every jot and tittle. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. He is the culmination. He's the end of the law. It's all about him. All scripture is a testimony to Christ, and he himself is the focus of scriptural revelation. So how then are we to keep the Sabbath? If we're still supposed to keep the Sabbath, and if it doesn't look like applying Sabbath laws to Sundays, the first day of the week, how then are we to keep it? Well, Hebrews chapter 4 provides the answer. Hebrews chapter 4, and this is not a scripture that's listed under the the proof text, under the article, but it's vital for understanding this doctrine. And here in Hebrews 4, the writer is arguing that there is a Sabbath rest remaining for God's people because he promises it in Psalm 95. So I declare on oath in my anger they shall never enter my rest. And that's cited in Hebrews 4, verse 3. And he says that Joshua, the the one who succeeded Moses as leader of God's people, didn't bring them into that rest. Even though he brought them into the promised land, that really wasn't the rest. So he says there must be another rest remaining. So in Hebrews 4, verse 9, And following, we read, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. That is, the generation that refused to listen to God's word and enter into that rest, who perish in the wilderness. He's saying, don't be like them. But we do keep the Sabbath, we do enter the rest by faith in Christ. It's not that the Sabbath has just been done away with. 
The Sabbath rest is a real thing, but the rest that we've been promised is better than stopping our work on a certain day of the week. The Sabbath rest that remains for us is the joyful contentment of eternal communion with God. And that is what we are to enter into. That's how we keep the Sabbath faithfully. So the Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ. It's not something that remains on Saturday. It's not something that has just been transferred to Sunday, the first day of the week. It's not merely ceremonial. We are to keep it. We are to obey it, but we obey it now by resting in Christ. By resting in Christ. So then where that leaves us is that keeping the Sabbath is actually separate from and distinct from observing the Lord's Day. These are actually two different issues, even though they often get conflated because of the belief that all the Sabbath teaching now has been transferred to Sunday. These are actually two different questions. So we keep the Sabbath by having faith in Christ, by trusting in Him, entering His rest. How do we observe the Lord's Day? How do we observe the Lord's Day? We observe the Lord's Day by remembering what it commemorates. What it commemorates. So it's on the first day of the week. It is a Christian institution for regular observance. And that Christian institution part is important, pointing to the significance of New Testament teaching on this. And it commemorates the resurrection of Christ from the dead. It commemorates the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And in each of the four Gospels, we're told that Christ rose on the first day of the week, the day we call Sunday. And just to pick one example, in Mark 16, verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? And of course, when they get there, there's nothing in the tomb. The stone has already been rolled away, and they're told that he is risen, the one they're looking for. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. It commemorates the resurrection of Christ from the dead, the most significant moment in history when the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, his righteous, perfect sacrifice of his precious blood in the place of sinners is vindicated. It's received by God the Father so that he now has triumphed over sin and death. When he says, it is finished, it is finished. He's the Lord of life, Lord over death. And so every Lord's Day, every Sunday, every first day of the week then, is a celebration of what we tend to only celebrate on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, or it should be. That's the reason. It, we don't gather because a certain local church has scheduled a service for 9.30 or 11 or whenever. We don't show up on Sunday morning out of habit. We don't do it because uh, we just think we should. We do it because Jesus is alive, because the tomb is empty, because he's the Lord. And he's the Lord of the church, and we're all accountable to him. That's what the Lord's Day commemorates. Next question, what should it include? Okay, we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ from the dead. That there should be this uh, celebratory tone to the overall tenor of our, of our worship because Christ is risen and that changes everything. It changes everything for history. It changes everything for our lives. It makes all the difference that he's risen. He's not just a figure on a stained glass window. He's not just a character in a book. He's not just a historical figure. He's alive. He's risen. He's reigning and he will return. That's who we're celebrating. So what should it include? What, what is he worthy of? It should include exercises of worship 
and spiritual devotion, both public and private. Worship. The risen Christ is worthy of nothing less than our worship, of our adoration, of awe, and and our submission to him as Lord, to do whatever he commands us to do. It should include spiritual devotion. Every Lord's Day, we should be spending time in the Word. We should be spending time in prayer. We should be doing these things together. If we're not spending time in the Word, if we're not spending time in prayer, if we're not singing God's praises together, if we're not contributing our our time, our talent, our treasures, if if we're not giving everything to the Lord in worship, in humble adoration, then we're not celebrating the Lord's Day. And this is something that is to happen publicly and privately. Our worship and our spiritual devotion isn't just limited to what we often call the worship hour. We should be worshiping him and, and mindful of his victory over sin and death throughout the day and celebrating that and rejoicing in that and giving thanks for that. That's how we keep the Lord's day. We worship. We devote ourselves to to spiritual disciplines, both public and private. Then the next question is, what must it exclude? What should we not be doing on the Lord's Day? What is forbidden? Well, the Baptist Faith and Message says, activities on the Lord's Day should be commensurate with the Christian's conscience under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, we get some clarity in Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse 5. Romans 14, verse 5. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And Paul goes on to warn against a judgmental attitude toward brothers and sisters. So what does this mean? What what should be excluded on the Lord's Day? Anything that makes your conscience feel condemned and guilty before the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything that burdens your conscience as, as your conscience has been shaped and formed by the person, the work of the Holy Spirit, and, and his sanctifying work in your heart. Anything that condemns you is to be avoided. But beyond that, we have liberty. We have liberty. So, if you grew up in a household where one day was treated as more sacred than another, and you go out and you cut your grass and you're feeling really guilty about that. Well, don't do it. Don't do it. If, if you, you, you know, your grandma, your mom told you, you don't do that on the Sabbath. Well, don't do it. If, if you feel burdened that you have leisure when other people are having to work, well, don't, don't go to that restaurant. Don't go to that movie. But if you're not burdened by that, then you have freedom to, to go on, on Sunday. So, <clears throat> some are going to see one day as more sacred than another. Others see every day as alike. Each one should be fully convinced in their own mind. This is between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. Between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how we honor the Lord's day. So, a couple of applications in light of this. We shouldn't treat the Lord's Day like any other day, because it's not. It is set apart. It is special. We should not forsake the assembling of ourselves. 
a, a faithful Christian should be showing up on the Lord's Day for worship when God's people gather at least once, at least once. And we understand some people have to work. We understand that there are contingencies, and, and this is the value of having gatherings on Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, having gatherings at other times of the week, and you should be as faithful as you can be whenever the church gathers, but especially on the Lord's Day, when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ gathers to commemorate and celebrate his resurrection and worship him and adore him as the resurrected Lord, you ought to be there. You ought to be there. The Sunday is not like any other day, and so we should push back against trends in the culture that, that would schedule soccer games and other events on times when people would be worshiping. That's, that's valid, and we don't need blue loss to do that. But it, it, we should not see it as any other day. And of course, this is how the culture sees it. The culture sees, oh, you get two days for the weekend, so might as well enjoy leisure time and vacation time on both of them. We don't see it that way. Sunday, the first day of the week, is the Lord's Day. It is unique. It is special because that's the day on which Jesus was resurrected. And so we should be gathering to worship him with his people on the Lord's Day. So we don't treat it just like any other day. But neither should we turn it into a legalistic test of fellowship and obedience. Right? Um, but I saw you go into the movie theater on Sunday. Tisk tisk. Um, you know, how many chapters of your Bible did you read on the Sabbath? Did you take a nap? You know, and, and I, I guess that's allowed on, on a day of rest. Uh, I saw you out weed eating. <laughs> your, your weeds are pulling weeds on the Sabbath. You, you know, this can get ridiculous, and that's what Jesus is saying that. We should not turn the Sabbath into that. That's not what it's intended to be. Now, there is, there is value in understanding the place of rest and having a healthy rhythm in your life of, of work and rest. That is a principle from God's Word uh, grounded in the pattern of creation that we can apply, and, and, and we should learn from that. But that's distinct from the specific issue of the Lord's Day and keeping the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is about the resurrection of Jesus. It is a Christ, Christian institution for regular observance. So uh, I hope this in, injects some, some passion into Sunday morning gatherings that, that we remember. We're here because the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. He is Lord. He is worthy of our worship. And if that doesn't bring any excitement to your heart, then do you believe it? Are, are you ready to gather when God's people gather? You want to sing the Lord's praises with God's people. You want the, the, the word of Christ to dwell richly in our midst as, as we teach and admonish one another with songs and hymns and spiritual praises. That's what we want to do. So this is the Lord's Day. What a joyous celebration it is. Let's rejoice in it, because it is the day that the Lord has made. So let's rejoice in it and be glad in it for his glory. Amen.